os voy a dejar ahora con, con Javier Cénica Celaya, que junto a Íñigo Saloña son los premiados de este año 2014. Él va a contar un caso muy interesante de recuperación de la identidad de, un, de una nación completa, como decía, para que abordemos este tema desde otra escala también diferente. Buenos días a todos. Bueno, antes de nada, quiero también agradecer a la Escuela de Arquitectura de Madrid por la amabilidad y la hospitalidad que siempre brindan para estos acontecimientos. Por supuesto, a Alejandro, eh, una persona incomparable en su dedicación, su empeño y su interés por la arquitectura. Eh, y a quienes son responsables de, estos, de, este, de este premio, como son la Fundación Driehaus y la Escuela de Arquitectura de Notre Dame en los Estados Unidos, y sin lugar a dudas a, al profesor Manzano Martos, inspirador del premio, referente incuestionable para toda aquella persona que esté interesada en la historia, en la identidad, en la recuperación del patrimonio, y en tantos valores que, que, que son trascendentales en, en la arquitectura. A todos y a todos ustedes, muchas gracias. Sin más dilación, yo quería traer un caso aquí que lo he titulado, bueno, antes de nada quiero decir, a petición de, de Alejandro, eh, que no te veo, voy a hacer la charla en, en inglés. Intentaré mejorar la pronunciación lo más posible para que se entienda, pero un poco en deferencia a la audiencia angloparlante presente y para hacer este mix entre inglés y castellano. El título, como ven, es La identidad local como un valor universal. Y citaré un caso nada más, solamente uno, pero que explica y refleja muy bien esta obsesión por lo universal en un caso específico y local como es un ejemplo en Suecia. 15 years ago, I organized in San Sebastián an international congress under the title Identity, Context and Globalization. At the time, few international organizations pointed out the relevance of discussing the issue of identity in view of the increasing size of the global economy and culture. Talking about identity was quite a novelty. The question of identity was heavily demonized by the international style in architecture since the 30s of the past century, and for almost one century was terribly bad considered to even tackle the issue. The international style exhibition of 1932 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York established the preconditions that a building needed to fulfill in order to qualify for the status of belonging to the international style, what it was called international style. Needless to say that reaching such a status was, at that moment, the ideal aspiration of any building, of any architect. And here we have the three preconditions. It's extremely reductive. With those three conditions, I mean the volume versus mass, The absence of, uh, it's difficult to see really from here, it's true. It's está muy escorado, as Leopoldo pointed out. Absence of symmetry and absence of uh, uh, ornamentation. With that, that's it. You reach the status of inter international. It's very simplistic to, to reduce it to that, very reductionist. The exhibition in New York was closing with the flores, the prevailing atmosphere of the previous years, in the decade of the 20s in Europe, where there was a general claim for intellectuals by intellectuals for international architecture. The resolute pursuing of internationalism was considered as the only way for putting an end to the confrontations between the different European nations. It was seen as the way to prevent another world war after the devastating effects of First World War. Up to that moment, in the turn of the century, and before that exhibition in New York, in the different European nations, there was a reaction against the prevailing eclecticism in architecture. There was a general claim for searching a local identity in architecture. The great masters at the time suggested the convenience of looking at vernacular architecture on one hand, and at the great examples of architecture in the history of their own regions on the other hand. 
This situation took place all over Europe, with no exception. Did going back to the national roots, to the national precedents, mean a setback in the development of architecture? It was not seen in that way at all. Let me explain it with one example in Sweden. Those architects claiming for a national architecture, claiming for a type of architecture that could be identified as Swedish, belong to what is known as the National Romantic Movement. In fact, in Europe, the introspective aspect into their own country took place after the Napoleonic Wars as a reaction against a pretended unified and uniform Europe under a French rule. It was indeed a romantic reaction, as it was also a romantic or rather idealistic vision, the one supported by Logier, who considered nature as the purifying milieu for the urban citizen corrupted by culture. This explains that the aristocracy and the royalty, following Logier's idea, built farms in the gardens of their palaces in order to spend time carrying out the life of humble peasants for purifying their corrupted spirits. In Sweden, Ragnar Osberg, one of these persons ascribed to the Romantic movement, uh, said about Swedish architecture in 1909, the first decade of the century, in Architectural Record, this American magazine. This is the city hall of Stockholm, built by this famous architect Ragnar Osberg. And he said, the cosmopolitan character of the 19th century brought to Sweden, perhaps in a greater degree than any than, than, than to other civilized nations, a mixture of historic styles, from Greek to the Renaissance, or the Middle Ages and the Baroque, all based rather upon academic knowledge than upon the true artistic feeling for architecture. In our country, as in many others, the excessive amount of foreign material has prevented the development of a uniform type of architecture. Excuse me. It has been recognized during the last decade that this universal spirit in an art-like architecture, which is influenced by climatic and local conditions, presents a distinct danger for the building art. For this reason, the problem of today with Swedish architecture is to develop the national architecture based upon the study of national edifices. edifices. Well, this was the advice of the comment or the concern uh, of Mr. Osberg in relation to his own country. Architects such as Gunnar Asplund, Sigurd Leverens, Hakon Alberg, among others, follow the indications of their teachers like the mentioned Ragnar Osberg, Karl Vesmant, and others. They visited different buildings in the nations. They drew them measured them, and took a good notice of the context in which they appeared. When this generation of younger architects started their careers, they did search a national character for their projects, and also they carried with them the romantic vision of an idealized rural and urban Swedish life, a kind of romanticism. As I mentioned before, let me propose an example. It is the well-known Woodland Chapel that we all know. In the Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm. Gunnar Asplund and Sigurd Leverens won the competition for the design of the cemetery in 1915. The Woodland Chapel that was built between 1918 and 1921 came into being as a result of postponing the construction of a main chapel at the entrance of the cemetery. Due to the lack of sufficient resources, indeed, uh, instead, sorry, of the proposed chapel in stone at the entrance of the cemetery, Asplund was asked by the cemetery authorities to design a smaller chapel in wood and stucco. The chapel's reference, uh, apparently, or one of the theories is, is the reference was taken 
from a, the cottage of a gardener in the in the, in a garden in in Denmark in Liselun that Asplon saw visited in his honeymoon. That's one theory. And then we have here the cottages in that park in Denmark, in the Isle of Mom. Constant Caroline Constant, a writer refers to the similarity in formal terms to a previous design by Sigurd Leverens for, uh, from the, this is again, uh, uh, the Isle of Mom. And Caroline Constant thinks that, she thinks that the reference was rather this example by Leverens, which is an assembly hall for the company Fair Glassworks in Sibhult in the south of Sweden. It seems more feasible, this second theory by Caroline Constant. While the building by Leverent uh, consisted in a large room uh, for assembly, preceded by a small entry hall and a kitchen, Asplund retained the assembly room, but suppressed the hall, here is Asplund's proposal, and placed a portico in its place. The allusion to this precedent by Leverent is quite direct. But by introducing the portico at the entrance, the chapel became a synthesis of a hut and a temple. A hut more linked to vernacularism and a temple to the great tradition of architecture. And then the two seems to meld together. Other aspects of the Asplund proposal differ from the possible precedent, such as the suppression of the windows and of the barrel vault. There is no barrel vault here. Instead, a cupola that does not appear on the outside with an oculus was included. The ceiling, flat at the perimeter, we'll see the ceiling in a second, the ceiling, which is flat in the perimeter, suddenly climbs up in the form of this cupola, having as its element of transition a set of eight columns quite distant from each other. Go back to see, here is the plan. We see the columns in, in form of a circle, quite distance, one column from, from, from the next. We see the portico with the eight columns also, preceding the, 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 the precinct, the room. The assembly room, a square with eight columns, establishes the setting arrangement in a circle around the coffin which is the real focus of the ceremony. It's interesting to see the presence of all kinds of symbolic allusions on one hand, as well as the coexistence of elements of classical extraction within an overall vernacular building. As for the symbolic allusions, one has to consider the setting of the chapel. Of importance is the open space that precedes the chapel. Let's see the open space. Here is the, the, the chapel, the woodland chapel the section, the interior, and then this is the open space. This is the, 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 the way that uh, directs us to, towards the entrance of the presence of the chapel. Of importance, as I say, is the open space that precedes the chapel. The access to the precinct from one of the main paths of the cemetery through a narrow and long gate in the west. This is the the narrow and long gate in the west. It's very, very deep. And the way out from, the, from that space, once, once we have entered, then we get out from, from a different side. We enter from the, from the west and we get out to the south. The idea of a sequence is a fundamental basis of the proposal. The sequence suggests no return, no way back but a succession of events, like the transition from life to a new eternal life through death. There is, therefore, a frontal encounter with the chapel, whereby we face a portico of white columns that support a triangular roof. This first view of the chapel makes, as I said before, the analogy to the temple more explicit. The portico is all painted in white. The columns, the walls, the ceiling is full of light. 
and does not allow unveiling what kind of a space is behind the powerful blind door of the chapel. There is a very heavy door to enter the, the, the chapel. So upon entering the room, the effect of surprise and the inevitable attraction of the, of the gaze to the lit vault produces a unique effect. Once the ceremony starts and the solid door opens, that wooden door, the view to the outside is filtered, is filtered uh, by uh, the delicately executed lattice work of this iron door. I mean, there is a heavy door that closes the chapel, and also this delicate uh, uh, piece of iron, you know, another second door, you know, that remains open while the ceremony takes place. Asplun has introduced upper light, as we have seen, as if it were in a classical temple, in one of these hypetral temples of, of Greece, you know, those temples that didn't have ceiling, the hypetral temples, emphasizing the operation with the cupola-like ceiling, which being a continuous surface, flat the ceiling and then climbing up as a cupola, does not have any discontinuity with the flat part of the ceiling. And as in the portico, the columns end against the ceiling. We can see that. Let's see if it's here with the best view. Well, as in the portico, inside and outside, the columns end against the ceiling without any kind of mediation of beams. There are no beams on top of the columns. It's the column and then a flat ceiling. Uh, no mediation of beams. Blank surfaces in material surfaces, sur surfaces, standing in an extremely simplified Doric order. This Doric order, taken in a Tuscan manner, I mean, is not Doric because the Doric has certain laws that uh, forces you to, it forces one to establish certain distances. I mean, if you put a, a Doric order, the next column has to keep a certain distance. Here, the distance is free, you know, it's completely unprejudiced. So it's more a Tuscan approach, which is the more adequate for, for the vernacular and for the rural milieus, you know. So the Doric order is taken in a Tuscan manner with a white intercolumnation in wood and painted in white, and by this, according to the vernacular. To make this more explicit, the echinus and the abacus, I mean the pieces of the, the two elements of the capital, the echinus, which is the round piece, and the abacus, the square, uh, of the column are very flat, are super flat. Just a minimal gesture to recall the required image of Doricism. And here we have the we have the touch that element, we can see in the drawing, the one uh, below, on the right hand, we can see how is the capital. The capital has a very flat echinus and also a very flat abacus. And then on top of that, there is no beam at all. There is no an architrave or anything like that. It's just the flat ceiling, which is, let's say, a heterodox approach, but still, it it approaches us more to a vernacular way of dealing with the orders, which is always an unpre unprejudiced uh, approach, you know, no prejudice. So, just a minimal gesture to recall the required image of Doricism. This irregular way of dealing with the columns by shattering them against the ceiling reveals the great control of the wealth of effects that Asplund, I finish in one minute exercises by distorting the elements of classicism or by taking classical language to its very limits. Wood singles having, well, singles, you see, in the roof, The Angel of Death by Karl Miles. White singles having tufts of grass that have been accidentally grown into them cover the roof of the chapel which merges with the atmosphere of greenery of the forest. This integration with the outside world, with the materials of the outside world, increases the vernacular character. This example literally follows the advice that Asplund gave to the Swedish architects. Asplund said, the architect can achieve that a new building seems to have emerged naturally from its context, 
borrowing the scale, the materials, the way of building and the style of the buildings around it. Not many examples of that period show such an easiness in dealing with both, both vernacular and classical references, which are so extremely well intertwined and merged with the side. In the Woodland Cemetery, Asplund and also Leverence dealt as much with the landscape as with the buildings. Nature becomes an intrinsic element. The trees also made a great contribution to the character of the meditation grove, we see the meditation group up there. Midway between a mound and a landscape by Caspar David Friedrich, this romantic painter from Germany, born in Pomerania, but Pomerania was Swedish at the time. This interlacing of references to Nordic vernacularism and classical cultural traditions pervades the woodland cemetery, presenting a wealth of meanings to the visitor the visitor that can always recognize him or herself in those archetypal evocations. Any visitor immediately recognizes himself or herself. This recognition is the expression that local identity is a universal value too. Thank you very much. <laughs>